what I'd like to do is thank Mel for a great presentation. Uh, and the first thing that I'd like to do is just to get you to summarize what you've talked about. Very briefly. Sure. Yeah. Um, so today I talked about habit formation and developing practices to help you reach your goals. And a couple of the major points on that were when you are working towards a goal and changing your habits, you're going to have slip-ups because it's difficult to change your brain in that way. So when you have a slip-up, jumping right back on and getting back to consistency is the fastest way to get you to a point where you replace your old habit with a new better one. Um, and another big point, something people forget about a lot, is to develop social support. So you really want to go to your friends, you want to go to your family, you want to let them know that the goal you're working towards really matters to you. And in almost all situations, people who love you are going to support you and help you out with that goal. And if they don't, you should probably say bye to those friends and that family. Just kidding, not even keep them. But um, developing that social support is really important towards developing these new habits that support your goals. Okay, now one of the things that we talked about was <clears throat> setting a self-identity. So very typically people identify a certain trait or behavior as being intrinsic to their personality. Yeah. Uh, and oftentimes they can get quite a lot of inertia behind these things. Um, what we wanted to ask is, how do you first of all get, you talked about changing that identity mm -hmm. to something different, how, how much you go about doing that? Yeah, so something you can do is, first of all, awareness is kind of the first step in any change. So start recognizing these things that you do, like if you say, I'm lazy, as an explanation for things that you haven't done all the time, that starts to become a part of your identity, and data shows the more those kinds of things are associated with your identity, the harder it will for be for you to change them. So your first step is to recognize that you're doing that, and then starting to sort of keep a log of these ways that you're defining yourself that aren't productive and aren't what you want to be, and start replacing them with new identifications. I am an athlete because I train four times a week. These kinds of affirmations and develop a slow change in how you see yourself. Mm. And how might you attach some gravity to those? So actually attaching a sort of value or importance so that they can actually offset those old ones? Yeah, I think um, one of the best ways to do that is sort of counterintuitive. It's not as much making it important as it yeah. is making it supported by evidence. So instead of just saying, I'm an athlete, yeah. I'm an athlete because I am this because, and take the data from your actual life, your new habits, the new things you're doing, and support that own evidence to solidify it in your own mind. Uh, and to tie into the last point, I just wanted to ask about how you might set up your environment for success. Okay, yeah, that's really super important. So our human brains are really sensitive to stimulus response reactions. So if we have a context or a cue that's repeated a lot and a response that we go from that cue, it's difficult to break. So if you can start to change the context or change the cues, like if you have a friend who you go out drinking and eating with a lot, um, don't get rid of the friend, but you can put them in a new context. You guys can go on a hike or do something different so that you develop a new association with that friend and can stop going down the old pathway that you're trying, trying to break. Mm. And in terms of the slippery slope response, whereby if someone breaks a habit that they're trying to set, or they, they break a, a, a behavior that they're trying to ingrain, um, how do we stop the, um, almost inevitable response that they will just keep going down the slope. Right, have one beer and then yeah. drink for the whole week and yeah. eat pizzas, right? Yeah. yeah, so that's a very human thing to do. It's a very fundamental part of human psychology that if you make one mistake, you like to write off a certain chunk of time after that and just carry on with making mistakes. Yeah. So the best thing to do is just, again, awareness. Start noticing when you're making the mistake. Stop yourself as early as possible. And if you can just shorten the impact of the mistake slowly over time, that in itself is a win. So the mistake is a part of the process. It's going to happen. But if you can start to eliminate and reduce the mistake slowly by recognizing them and cutting yourself off from the slippery slope, that can be really helpful. Okay. And the last question I'll ask for now is, uh, you talked about, and just now you've talked about the supportive environment and people who will inevitably be your cheerleaders, hopefully. Right. Um, but when we're talking about people who are close by who um, may experience jealousy um, and may subconsciously try and subvert your attempts to actually do whatever it is that you're trying to do, whether it be weight loss or uh, strength gain or whatever, uh, by, by trying to break your habits subconsciously, um, how do we approach that? Yeah, well, I think if you go to your friends and you sit down and you tell them what you want and you tell them it's important to you and that you value it, they're either going to support you or they're gonna to pretend to support you at least in a public environment. So you sort of diminish their capacity to have a bad effect just by doing that. Because once you've said that to them, most people, even if they are jealous and want to support your goals, they're not gonna do it publicly and they'll be embarrassed to do it publicly. So you've eliminated you know, some of their impact. And then 
if someone is like that in your life, probably just eliminating from the eliminating them from your life is going to benefit you on many levels. But at very worst, if you tell them, they can't publicly. Okay, so final question is, if you give one tip to anybody who's uh, wanting to start um, either weight loss or, or strength gain or any particular personal goal, what would be the, the, the number one most important thing that you'd recommend to them um, with regard to their goal setting? Ooh, can I make it two? Yes. Okay, so the first most important thing is to, when you outline your goal, make sure that it is an intrinsic goal that's driven by something you personally want when you're alone in your room and not by other people's social pressure and things like this because you probably won't achieve it if it's not an intrinsic goal. And then the second, second thing would be to assess the trade-offs and make sure that you're prepared to make them knowing that it's not going to be a linear progress kind of thing. There's going to be ups and downs and just accept that you'll be making trade-offs and working towards this goal for a while before you get it. Okay. So realistic expectations and a good goal outline. Yeah. And can we accept that intrinsic and extrinsic uh, goals aren't necessarily binary but a, but a, but a gradient? Oh, of, um, course, of course, yeah. Can we accept that there's a certain amount of extrinsic... Um, Pressure. Uh, yeah, th yeah, that we actually want? Um, with regard to making the goal oh, yeah. more valuable. Oh yeah, you absolutely want extrinsic pressure as in accountability and support yeah. and things like that. But the thing that you're working towards has to be something that you want inside of you. That's mm. what I mean by that. Not that you know everyone at your gym thinks that you should have abs, but you right. don't really care about abs. You just feel like you're supposed to. Yeah. That kind of thing. So make sure you want it from deep inside. But sure. perfectly okay and helpful actually to have people, yeah. other people supporting that and helping pressure you to work yeah. towards what you want. Would you consider that some extrinsic factor is actually be better than just strictly intrinsic? You mean a lack of accountability or help as a Yeah, as with to regard to an intrinsic goal yeah. may be one that someone values so highly that they know it's never under threat and so they can effectively waste time or, or, or delay uh, yeah. knowing that eventually they will do it because it has Absolutely. such value but yeah. extrinsic, extrinsic pressure may put a time frame on or... or um, For sure, yeah. I, I, having accountability and having people around you who are helping you think about your progress and that goal is very important. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and the final uh, tip for the coach who's, who's about to take someone on, uh, it could be a new coach, it could be a coach that's just trying to improve their methods. Um, what, what's the most important thing that you would get the coach to do with regard to yeah. setting goals for their client? Yeah, so I think thinking about clients' motivations and things like that, a lot of people forget you get all of the metrics of their weight and what their physical goals are and things like this, but sitting down and talking to them to them about what other aspects of their lives, like kids, parties, work, things that will interfere with their goal progress, and talking to them about the trade-offs that will need to be made to get to a certain goal can sometimes help them manage their expectations for what they'll be able to do given the context of their lives and other interests. Thank you, Dr. Melissa. I'm joined here with Dr. James Hoffman from Renaissance Periodization, and he is known as a recovery guy. So he'll be speaking today on his presentation, which was on physique, balancing physique and lifestyle. And um, it was, I found it very interesting to, to see the different levels of, of I guess, of, you know, from pro right down to you know, different levels there. And I found it to be, it's good to, to understand where people are at in, in, their, in their physique and their training performance sort of goals. And I'll, I'll let James summarize what he spoke about now. So, thank yeah, you. thanks. It's really great to be here. And uh, it's, it's really interesting because everybody wants to be, you know, kind of towards their best in all sport. And with physique, it's like something where you might not compete, but we all want to have a nice physique. We all want to look good, whether it's naked or whatever, but we want to have a nice physique. The problem is, is the physique training, the diet, the recovery stuff, it's just all consuming. It just takes up all of your time and it just gets really frustrating for some people. So uh, my talk is really about understanding the trade-offs between how deep you want to go into physique and how much of your lifestyle you have to compromise along the way. So we kind of broke it down into some different categories, right? Like one being a professional level physique competitor. And we say, yeah, you know what? Like you have to be on point all the time. You don't get a break. You're training, your nutrition, all that stuff all the time. But you don't have to live like that if you're not an active competitor or somebody who's trying to win titles and sponsorship and things mm -hmm. like that. So we can work our way down and say, hey, you might have somebody who's, we call them kind of the uh, professional where you're <laughs> trying to win competitions, but it's not your whole life. Maybe you've got a job, maybe you've got other stuff going on. And we kind of think about what things can we give up a little bit in terms of physique development 
to maintain a good balance in lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And then we can work our way down even further. We say, okay, you have people who are kind of recreational and non-competitive. They just want to look good. They want to have a good life, but they're not necessarily going to step on a bodybuilding stage anytime soon. And they're a little bit more flexible. They can be a little bit looser with their diet, a little looser with their training, but still maintain a pretty good regimen most of the year. And then you kind of have kind of your recreational people who just want to be fit and healthy and look good. And maybe they got other hobbies, so they don't want to be weighing their food, doing all their macros all the time. Maybe a little bit of the time, but maybe not all the time either. Yeah. And I think that it's important to know as well that people might go through waves of being a level one or level two or level three. Yes. And how have you found that with coaching over the years and taking people from different levels, either regressing them or progressing? Have you, have you found it to be difficult or? Yeah, sometimes it's more of a matter of necessity where people will start mm -hmm. at like, um, you know, like trying to become professional and then something happens. Like they might have a death in the family. They might mm -hmm. have unexpected financial problems where maybe they lost their job or something like that. And then they have to either back off, which is more often what we see. It's rare that we yeah. see somebody who's like, oh, I won the lottery, so now I want to be Mr. Olympia, yeah, right? Exactly. It's usually yeah. like, hey, I broke up with my spouse, or I got a divorce, or my sister died, and I have to mm. take care of my family, or something like that. And then they go from like a two, or down to like a three or a four, and they say, I was training really hard, I was doing everything right, and now I just can't anymore, because mm. there's more important things going on in my life. Yeah. And so one of the things we try to tell them is like, that's perfectly okay. There's no shame. There's mm. no, um, you shouldn't feel bad about having to downgrade because you just have different priorities in life, right? Yeah. And so it's just a matter of trade-offs where you say, yeah, you can't be Mr. Olympia or Miss, uh, you know, any, any of the other titles right now. And you might get there someday, but you just got other stuff going on. Yeah. And so you can't just be penny pinching your macros and doing training all the time. You got a job, you got a family to take care of. That's fine. Now in the event, sometimes people do want to move up and they say, hey, my life is actually like really good really stable. I was basically a recreational person and I want to kind of dip into the competitive level a little bit. Yep. And then we say, okay, that's great. Now just understand where you were kind of loose and not so tidy on things. Now you've got to like start getting more rigid and get, get more strict. And for a lot of people, that's a big shift, right? Yep. Where it's like, oh, I used to go out once a week for dinner. And now you say, yeah, you probably can't do that most of the time. Yeah. And where do you find the, the mental side of things when it comes to, to this as well? Like, do you find that people respond well in most cases, or would you say they need to have a very deep talk with, with their coach? And, and yeah. I think some guidance with the coach is good, but I think the big dialogue is the internal one, right? Yes. Where you say like, what is realistic for me to do right now? Can I actually put in the time and effort to step on stage or to be the best me? And a lot of times the answer is no. And mm. coming to terms with that and understanding like, that's okay. Yeah. My whole life doesn't revolve around physique training necessarily all the time. And so I think the first one is kind of getting them to recognize like, what do you actually want to get out of this right now? Yeah. What do you think you can reasonably accomplish? And then they come back to the coach and say like, okay, this is kind of what I'm thinking. And then you can give them feedback and help guide them along the way. But the problem that we get a lot on the mental side is they don't actually understand what mm. they want or they don't understand the trade-offs it's gonna to take to get there. And yeah. that's when having a coach can help guide as well and say, hey, look, like, you want to be Mr. Olympia or you want to be the next Dana Lynn Bailey, like, it's going to take a lot. Like, you're going to be training yeah. three hours a day. You're going to be, like, doing all your meal preps all the time mm -hmm. and just getting them to understand that. Yeah. I guess my final question on this then, and it's actually really good to end with the possibility of training three hours per day. Let's say you have someone that has, for most of their life, say they're in their 20s, they don't um, have kids yet, and they've got on stage before and they've actually done quite well. Say the circumstances change where we use the example of they have kids, they have a more stressful job. If they cannot commit to the well, three hours a day we're looking at, what training strategies have you come up with or thought of that could actually help them to still achieve, maybe not 100% level, but we'll, we'll say 95 in this, in this context, um, around their actual individual training sessions and maybe they might can only have to do say an hour and a half or two hours per day. Mm -hmm. So what's at a 30% drop, but are there any things within training that you could you know with say supersetting that sort of thing, could that help? Yeah, or? there are some things, and this is something we have actually talked about uh, recently on one of our webinars, and mm. so if, if time is the biggest constrictor, then you have to use time-saving strategies, and that's when those intensification techniques like using supersets or giant sets yeah. or any, like antagonist-style supersets yeah. can be really handy. So normally when, when we're dealing with somebody and time is not the limiting factor, right? We say, like, mm. you have all the time in the world to train. We would say, yeah, you probably don't want to do that just because you'll get a little bit of an edge not doing it, at mm. least on the individual muscle groups you're training. But 
in that situation, you have somebody who's like, I can't do three hours. So what do you got to do? Well, you got to make the most of the time you have. Yeah. And that's when using the antagonist supersetting and, and those kind of intensification techniques can mm -hmm. be really useful. And again, like we are, we're big on like the volume landmarks. So we still say, hey, you might not be at your absolute best, but try to hit your MEVs, your MAVs, your MRVs, all of those things yeah. to the best of your ability. Yeah. And I guess with that too, that might lower their stress, mm -hmm. knowing they don't have to go for that three hours and that that actually could have a more of a positive impact, or at least for the long term. Yeah, like uh, a liberating effect. Like, yes. yeah, actually I don't have to do that. I can do like a really good one and a half, maybe two hours if I get lucky, yeah. and I'm still gonna be in pretty good shape. Yep, yeah. no, that's right. Well, James, thank you very much. Thanks for having that's me. It's awesome, and uh, look forward to dinner tonight. We can chat yeah. nice. <laughs>
Um, so to say that we can actually remodel the entire thing is sort of like saying we can remodel the entire rainforest, you know, with one protocol. It's just not possible. And even though things like diet and exercise may cause changes in specific, a few specific taxa, so some species of bacteria, you know, if you're looking at three species out of thousands that are changing, you really can't, I don't, I don't think you can make the claim that, you know, you're um, doing anything significant to the entire microbiome. And even when we do see changes in just the organisms present, we don't necessarily then see the same change in terms of the function. So it may actually remain very stable, even if we do see some minor changes in who's there. Right. And just as a tangent before the next question, is there any way that you can give some kind of scope to anyone listening? How would you describe the magnitude of what we're looking at when we when we talk about the gut microbiome in terms of either numbers or, 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 or magnitude of... of um, I guess this, this entire ecosystem that we're looking at. Um, it really, it really is like an ecosystem. So we have a mix of diverse organisms. So we have uh, bacteria, we have archaea, we have yeasts, um, protists. Uh, we have non-living organisms, viruses there that may infect human cells or that could infect bacterial cells. They're all interacting with one another. They're also interacting with their environment. So with our own intestinal cells and with our immune cells. They interact with the nutrients that are present, and so to do our cells. They can produce nutrients for our cells. They can modulate our immune system. So it's really, really complex. I mean, it's like we're trying to um, you know, explore the bottom of the ocean or go to a new planet. We just don't know very much about it, and, and the more that we learn, the more questions arise. Right. So to say, for instance, that we can take a probiotic or some other supplement that, that, that provides X number of bacteria or some such, I mean, this is like a drop in the rainforest or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And it, there, you know, there may be <laughs> effects. We do have a few probiotics that are effective for a few specific things, but we don't really understand the mechanisms very well. Um, we can't say that it's going to uh, have the same effect on every individual. And uh, in most cases, it seems like, especially when we're looking at a healthy population, they don't really seem to do anything, which is arguably a good thing because we don't want to have a microbiome that's so sensitive to just minor perturbations that it's significantly altered by a diet or exercise intervention. Uh, a question that may be relevant to many of the people who are watching this uh, with regard to people who are either prepping for competition or getting ready for photo shoots, uh, people who will diet to lean levels uh, and their coaches, uh, there seems to be an increase in incidence of functional gut disorders, uh, oftentimes temporary but sometimes persistent, uh, that occur when somebody does get either um, very lean or at least leaner than they ever have done before. Um, can, we, can we draw that back to the gut microbiome? Uh, let's say, for instance, in the case of a FODMAP uh, intolerance that seems to induce itself. Um, what can we say about this? Do, do we have any idea as to what the mechanism is? Um, and do we have any idea as to how we might restore this or at least expedite the restoration of the gut in that particular case? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is actually very little research in competitors and athletes specifically. Um, the role of the microbiome in exercise and the impact of, of exercise and even diet on the microbiome is still oh. relatively new. Uh, we started to characterize that relationship um, in about the mid 2000s. So it's maybe just in, in less than, you know, maybe 10 years that we've really been looking at this. Um, and you know, stuff in, in athletes just in the past several years. So um, that being said, there have been some studies on um, individuals with, with uh, eating disorders like anorexia nervosa and, and long-term caloric deprivation. And that does have an impact on the microbiome. Um, you can think of it just in terms of any organism, they, they need nutrients. And so if the um, fiber content of the diet is very low, uh, that does have an impact on the microbiome. So if an individual is really reducing their caloric intake, fiber content usually then will fall just as a function of lower food intake. Um, that being said, in some cases, people will actually really increase their vegetable intake in order to increase uh, food volume, help can control hunger, and that could have you know, a potentially beneficial effect in terms of supplying more nutrients to the microbiota. But as a result of the increased fiber intake, there's an increase in gas production as well, and that can lead to bloating. Um, now certainly, you know, FODMAP um, sensitivity is sort of dose dependent. So if a person was having, you know, a manageable amount of FODMAP uh, intake previously, and then all of a sudden now their, their diet is much higher in these FODMAPs, 
then they could experience you know, uh, an increase in, in gastric distress. Gut motility also changes with um, caloric deprivation, so it's possible that you know, with reduced gut motility, so food is moving through the gastrointestinal tract more slowly, the bacteria have more time to interact with it, and then you know, could potentially increase uh, uh, gas production in that respect as well. Um, I think that there's a lot of, um, there's sort of a theory going around about, you know, the, the eating a specific food over and over again creates then an intolerance to that food. Um, there's really no evidence that I've seen to support that notion. It's just sort of a, um, I think a thing that, you know, people follow like a logical progression and then come to that conclusion. Um, but I think that's sort of also a misunderstanding about what creates, you know, an intolerance versus, um, you know, what might be an allergy or something like that. So I think it's just an area that, you know, does need more research. Um, I know there have been a few recent studies out comparing the microbiomes of like bodybuilders versus endurance athletes and looking at, you know, some of the correlations between specific macronutrients and um, relative abundance of specific species. And so, you know, the specific macro ratios do also seem to play a role. So absolutely there are interactions and there are changes occurring. We just don't really know um, the details yet. Yeah, uh, and as a side note, can we uh, delineate the difference um, between uh, the effects relative to the energy availability given to the microbes uh, as compared to the energy status of the host? Yeah, so we can divide uh, carbohydrates, which are really probably the most important energy source for really both, um, uh, into digestible carbohydrates, so those are sequestered by the host. So those are the carbohydrates for which we have digestive enzymes. We break them down into their smallest subunits and then absorb those and extract energy from them. Um, there are also indigestible carbohydrates. So those pass through the small intestine and reach the colon where they're then fermented by the bacteria. Uh, so if we have a diet that is high in digestible carbohydrates but very low in fiber, that may provide us with plenty of energy, but the bacteria will still sort of be starved in a way. So if we're eating a lot of refined carbohydrates that lack fiber and we're not getting sufficient fruits and vegetables, those bacteria will not receive the nutrients that they need. If we're eating a ton of vegetables, um, but you know, no um, digestible carbohydrates, like no starches, and we're really just eating a lot of you know, really um, fibrous veggies, the bacteria may have plenty of nutrients, but we're not going to be able to readily extract nutrients. But the bacteria can actually increase energy harvesting from the diet for the host. So they do that by fermenting those indigestible carbohydrates to short chain fatty acids, which are then readily available to us. So we can actually um, digest and absorb those just like we would a dietary fat. And so it, it's estimated that uh, in some individuals, bacteria may actually increase the uh, energy availability of the diet by about 10%. So that means that um, we may get an extra 10% calories that we're not necessarily accounting for. Right. Now, we, we know that there's perhaps a chicken and egg situation with regard to, um, there's, there's, there's perhaps a gut microbiome profile that may uh, exist in obesity. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the flip side, there are certain bacteria that may predispose toward obesity. Mm -hmm. um, what do we know about that so far? So that was based on a really remarkable sort of landmark study in the mid 2000s uh, in which a lab transplanted a microbiome from obese mice to germ free lean mice. So those mice did not have uh, a microbiota. And when they received that transplant from the obese mice, they then became obese either by increased appetite or increased energy harvesting. And the same did not occur when they were transplanted with microbiota from lean mice. They've also been able to replicate that with uh, microbiota from uh, twins discordant for obesity. That means one twin was lean and one was obese. And when they transplanted their microbiota into mice, those mice then took on the, the, the appearance of the uh, twin from which they received the donation. So the mice who received the lean donation remained lean, mice who received the obese donation then became obese. And so that's how they started to uh, identify the role between the microbiota and, and propensity towards obesity. Now, in humans, it's a little bit more complex because we're not able to actually do those studies. Humans are not ever going to be germ-free. 
Um, so, you know, there's potentially a predisposition depending on the profile of uh, the microbiota, but it could be that the diet, an obesogenic diet, is what's actually shaping the microbiome. So um, that gives us that we've nudged a little bit in the direction of, you know, causality. Um, but again, even if a person did have an obesogenic microbiome, it would just mean that they would have to probably eat a little bit less mm. than another person of, you know, the same uh, body size and the same physical activity level. So, you know, two people who have exactly the same body size and exactly the same lifestyle. If one person had a more obesogenic microbiome, they may need to eat a little bit less, but it wouldn't prevent them indefinitely from being able to control their body weight. Right. Uh, so my next question is a double header, and okay. it sort of comes off the back of that. Uh -huh. Uh, what would you say our um, current limitations are with regard to research and uh, what are the future directions? Um, well, right now we've actually seen some incredible technological advancements that have been able, uh, that have enabled us to, to identify um, species with uh, really detailed resolution. So now we can get a much better picture of um, the uh, form of the microbiome, so who's there, and then also the functions in terms of what genes are present, what genes are being expressed, um, what metabolites are being produced, so we can see what species are present and also what they're doing. Uh, but it's harder for us to then determine how they're interacting with each other and how those interactions are shaping the entire microbiome, how they're interacting with our, our cells and how our cells might be uh, interacting, you know, in terms of crosstalk. So um, it is just such a new area that, you know, we're coming up with a lot of correlations and sort of starting to identify relationships, but, you know, we're still very, very far away from a cause and effect type of relationship in most cases. Uh, but in the future, I think that, you know, we will be able to um, better structure uh, interventions and actually, you know, put together trials that are uh, able to nudge us in that, that direction of causality rather than just, you know, doing like case control studies and observational studies where we're just taking a group and sampling their, their feces and then, you know, coming up with correlations. I think another thing that we need to improve upon um, is, is uh, diversifying our sample sites. So we're not really just using um, stool samples, which is pretty much the most common um, sample site mm -hmm. for us, and, and, and the stool samples are an okay representation for what's happening in the distal part of the colon, but we're really not seeing the big picture of what's happening in the small intestine and more proximal parts of the large intestine. So we're sort of missing, um, you know, what could potentially be some really important information about what's going on in various parts of the gut as well. Right, and I think we've learned here that there's no one-size-fits-all approach, yeah. but if you could just give one practical takeaway uh, tip, mm -hmm. uh, your top tip uh, for anybody listening who, who might want to either improve their gut health or at least um, perhaps look after themselves a little bit better, what would you suggest that that would be? Eat plants at every meal. All right. Dr. Gabby. <laughs>
And uh, that is a fine way to train, it's a fine idea, but it, as we look a little bit more deeply into what happens over the course of a single training block, which is usually about three mesocycles of one sort of overarching goal, like a fat loss phase or a muscle gain phase, as we go from mesocycle to mesocycle to mesocycle, the uh, sort of constraints and benefits that we face might bias us into the direction of altering those repetition ranges or really how much work we do in those rep ranges. So we end up seeing this pattern where maybe it's a little bit more beneficial to train a little bit more of your volume in the heavier range, five to 10 earlier in the first mesocycle, then most of your training should be probably done in the moderate range, 10 to 20 reps in the middle mesocycle. And then towards the end of a training block, the last mesocycle, there is a decent argument to be made that more of your training than usual should come from the 20 to 30 rep range, which we otherwise sometimes call metabolic training. And there's a couple of good reasons for this, and of course I can't get into all of them in this sort of quick preview, but for example, when you're fresh in the first mesocycle of a training block, you're really primed to train heavy. Coincidentally, that's gonna be your lowest volume training and also you don't need much volume to grow them because you're very new to the training process. You just did some sort of resensitization mesocycle before. Eventually, as your volume climbs over each successive mesocycle you, and as you fatigue and as you accumulate a little bit more tissue damage, adding much, much more heavy training might not be realistic from a you're able to do it perspective and also maybe not the safest thing. And on the other side, we take a look and say, okay, what if we tried to train super light, high rep at the beginning? Well, that kind of training tends to uh, cause a really rapid adaptation in the body. For example, your vascularity adapts really quickly and all of a sudden you can't accumulate lactate with nearly as little effort as you could. And you have to do sets and sets and sets to get the same pump, the same burn. So maybe that kind of training is best safe for the end. Coincidentally, when we're a little bit too beat up to train heavy, but look, you can always do more sets of 20 to 30. That's not gonna get you hurt. And also it's this last shot at the end that really sort of puts the exclamation mark on the hypertrophy mesocycle. And then after that, you're at your highest volumes and you go back into a resensitization of some sort. So you basically start training most of your training heavy in the first mesocycle, moderate average training, 10 to 20 reps. And then the last mesocycle, there might be an argument for doing a little bit more of your training than usual with higher reps. And this also follows a pretty good frequency structure as well, where you tend to train with lower frequencies at the beginning of a block, higher at the end, and lower frequencies are just more conducive to training heavier, and higher frequencies are more conducive to training lighter, because you can squat heavy twice a week, you're probably not gonna squat heavy five times a week, but you can do very light uh, quad work or something uh, at the, you know, five times a week, no problem. And as a matter of fact, that kind of stuff doesn't tend to disrupt your connective tissue much. So if you're doing really high rep training, doing it not frequently doesn't make much sense, but doing it frequently makes a lot. So we kind of see this whole synthesis come together. It's just food for thought. It might not be the answer to everyone's hypertrophy plan, but it's probably a good idea to train a little bit heavier in the beginning of a block, uh, more moderate at the middle of the block and a little lighter at the tail end. That still means we, every exercise we do, let's say we do uh, squats the entire time, we might still do heavy, heavy, heavy in the squats. So we end, you figure, well, well how, shouldn't we be doing moderate squats in the second mass cycle and then lighter squats? Well, not necessarily. We can do squats heavy, 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 but then we add leg presses to the program in the second mass cycle and do them moderate, moderate. And then we add walking lunges in the last mass cycle and do them light. And we do more of the lunge sets later, not as many leg press sets, very few squat sets, and it ends up biasing the whole program where we still have our really good progressions all the way up in weight, we still put weight on the bar per exercise, but because of the way we add sets and exercises, the average loading falls over the course of the mass cycles. The result is a great deal of hypertrophy. And the last thing I'll say is, this is part of a periodized model for hypertrophy training, and the first thing people can think is say, well, gee, you know, that sounds like we're averaging lighter training over the course of time, and you know, even though the individual exercises are going up, that's good, isn't averaging lighter and lighter and lighter over the course of each meso kind of the reverse of what you would do with strength training? Yes, but that's not a problem because we're not trying to get necessarily stronger in the five to 10 rep range or the one to five rep range. We're trying to get bigger. And the number one critical factor for hypertrophy is volume. This allows us to increase volume by a radical amount and increase frequency, which also seems to increase hypertrophy a lot. And we could ask the question of well, what about getting super strong does that increase hypertrophy? Well, if you do it at the expense of volume, it doesn't, right? So the traditional periodized model that's designed for strength power sports has your volume starting high, frequency starting high, et cetera, and you drop all those factors and peak to get stronger. This doesn't necessarily flip the model upside down, but it sure as heck has some opposite features 
because we're trending towards another uh, outcome. We want growth. And that's really, I'll conclude my overly long summary with this statement, <laughs> that what we really want to do, the modern periodization uh, as a science, is an objective view at what are our conditions, what are our needs analysis, and what do we desire to be at the end of this process? And then we arrange training variables to get here. And the way we arrange them can end up looking nothing like periodization for another sport or for another fitness characteristic like strength or power or whatever, but it doesn't have to. If you're ordering, if you're cooking a different kind of meal at home, your, uh, what you buy to cook for it, what it looks like cooking, and how it tastes and looks might be very different depending on what you're cooking. So somebody who's used to making burgers can't be like, whoa, where's the, the burger patty on the bun? Like, well, we're making pizza. Those things don't exist. Well, what I thought good cooking means burgers. Like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> just the same way as good periodization for any number of fitness characteristics, including hypertrophy, doesn't just look like strength training periodization. Yeah, it's going to be very different, and that's the whole point. Right, so that's a great summary, Mike. Thank you. And my question is more around people that want both, so that, uh, that power building sort of type of thing, where, for example, they might go heavy early in the week and go lighter later in the week. How would somebody program that, but also understand the trade-off so they may not become the strongest or the biggest? Well, you know, I don't believe in trade-offs. I believe in willpower. And if you just grit your teeth <laughs> hard enough, <laughs> like if you growl at the weights, they'll respond, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, if that doesn't work, however, then what we do is uh, trade-offs, absolutely. One of the best ways to arrange that is to have different phases of training where you're trying to bias your training into the direction of either one of the benefits that you want. And uh, then after that phase is over, you bias it in the direction of the other one. So for example, if you want both a good measure of strength and hypertrophy, you can take one to two mesocycles and arrange it relatively optimally for hypertrophy, right? So you're doing the sort of training we just described. And then once those mesocycles are over, you rearrange your training relatively optimally towards strength. You drop your repetition ranges in the, you know, the one to eight rep range, and you drop your total volumes, and you include exercises that are more strength building rather than hypertrophy building, you know, more upright rows and presses versus more lateral raises and front raises and something like that. You've put on a lot of strength and a lot of size, but then the last couple of months have been strength training. Now you need to get bigger again. You flip the focus again and get into hypertrophy training. So you basically have to do a good job with what it is you're doing and commit most of your resources to it all the time. You know, again, it, it's almost like, you know, if you want to eat pizza and burgers, do you make sort of like a burger pizza conglomerate thing? And I don't know, it's probably not going to taste great. No, like one night you make pizza and you make a decent pizza and then another night you make burgers and it all works out. You, you get both. If someone says, I want to eat both pizza and burgers, but you do a good job making each individually. You don't mix the two together in some kind of like weird, like, it's like Carol <laughs> made it. Right, you know, assuming you cooking is genetically engineered. So uh, now there is something to say for a slight biasing into the other direction where during a hypertrophy cycle, keeping in mind that you also want a good measure of strength, you might take your average repetition ranges and it usually would be like sort of 15 reps would be your average, I suppose, right? Yeah. Uh, if you're just going for pure hypertrophy, you might drop that to 10 on average. So you might do a little bit more training in the 5 to 10 rep range and a little less training in the 20 to 30 rep range all the time in hypertrophy just because you know that neurologically uh, and muscle fiber composition, you're going to eventually want to optimize for strength. So you don't want to get too far away from that. Mm -hmm. And then when you're doing strength training, you might keep your volumes a little bit higher and keep in a little bit more accessory work just to continue to uphold maximum amount of musculature, not lose a whole lot. Because if you do like very peaking style strength work, it's going to result in the best strength outcomes, but you might lose a little muscle. So nothing you can't get back, but then the first couple of weeks of hypertrophy work, you're going to have to work to get it back, which is kind of a waste of your time. Mm -hmm. So if someone is power building and they're doing a strength block, uh, then it, some of the strength stuff is going to be identical to just what a pure strength training athlete would have, but you're going to pepper in a little bit more volume. The average reps could be just a little bit higher, right? Mm -hmm. And then for a, a person involved in a hypertrophy training who is a power builder or whatever, uh, if you look at them versus a pure bodybuilder, they're going to be training just that average a little bit heavier. And here's a really important point. They might never really delete away core strength moves. So like, I'm training for pure hypertrophy currently for a long time myself. I don't really care about strength so much by, by its own. I've sort of walked that path already. I won't do, you know, low bar squats or competition benches for months and years because I don't care. But someone who's a power builder who wants strength and hypertrophy, they may still do the same rep ranges as me, but when they pick their leg exercise, they might still say, okay, at least high bar squats. Maybe even some low bar work if they can handle it. 
definitely some competition pressing, but in the higher rep ranges. So there's some core exercises they're never gonna get away from because not only are they growing their muscles during that hypertrophy block, but they're saying, you know what, the strength block's gonna start soon. I need to be ready for that. I can't get too far away from that. I suppose the pizza burger analogy breaks down entirely at that point, because you're eating the pizza and you're like, hmm, but you're thinking about burgers. <laughs> <laughs> Which is me all the time. For sure. <laughs> uh, all right, we've got some great information there with regard to uh, optimizing or changing loading parameters to, um, uh, to look at strength and hypertrophy. Uh, but I want to bring it back to diet, uh, seeing as we brought up burgers and pizzas and their demonic hybrids. Um, with regard to optimizing, we'll go back to hypertrophy because that's what the uh, subject of the talk was about. If we're looking at uh, maximizing hypertrophy with, with the, uh, advanced periodization uh, 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 strategies, um, does nutritional periodization actually factor in as a, as a viable strategy? Does it have merit? Um, and what might it look like? Yeah, great question. So nutritional periodization is a real thing, but it tends to occur at the macro cycle level more than at the block level. So within a training block, nutritional approach is rather similar, or really it's unidirectional, it has one goal. For example, a training block of muscle gain basically is multiple mesocycles of training, which are a little bit different and sort of periodized between each other, but the nutritional approach is really similar during that time. It's just generate a hypercaloric diet, supply sufficient protein and carbohydrates, and make sure the body weight is going up as needed. But at the, you know, and, and then a cutting phase or a fat loss phase, the training is rather different mesocycle to mesocycle as we discussed, but um, that entire block might be a very similar nutritional strategy for meso to meso to meso, which is just progressively decrease calories while maintaining sufficient protein and as many carbohydrates as you can get away with. So the nutritional periodization is something that occurs at a macro cycle level. So block to block to block, you'll see distinct nutritional changes. Here's a really good example or really foundational example. Uh, you'll have a block of muscle gain where a hypercaloric diet is used to gain both muscle and fat. And ideally you'd gain mostly muscle, but sometimes that doesn't happen. So you'll be in a situation where your body will not be used to carrying that much muscle yet, but you'll be at your sort of biggest ever. And what you do is you take uh, you know, one month or two months to eat at maintenance and in, in part psychologically recover from having pushed that many calories or just do something with your calories versus just eat at maintenance. You keep that body weight up. And then after that, you enter another training block and you enter a fat loss diet where the purpose is Okay, you've got this muscle and fat, now the fat loss diet gets rid of the fat and you get back at the end of that fat loss diet to a place where you restart and say, okay, now I'm going to continue to gain more muscle. So you gain muscle and fat, hold the body weight for a second, let everything relax, that's another block. And then your third block, again, is a fat loss block where you do a reduction of fat and you sort of zigzag your way up and eventually you're just the net effect of every macro cycle, which is three blocks in a row, is that you gain muscle, gain muscle, gain muscle, and eventually, you know, you look super jacked, and that, that's how it works out. And there's other, uh, of course, everything in periodization is what is the demand, what is the need, other needs like contest prep, et cetera, or taking a person who's very over fat and reducing their body fat over time, the nutritional periodization is gonna look different, but it occur, occurs at a block level. This block is for this, this block is for that, this block is for that, and everything is phase potentiated, so one thing makes the next thing go better or the next thing deals with the side effects we've accrued in the other thing. Right. That's it. Dr. Mike. <laughs>